Hello, everyone. I'm Lakai Newman with SODA. Thank you for joining today's call. With global economies on full recovery mode for over a year and the longer term implications of a hybrid remote working model settling in, agency leaders are grappling with how to best navigate a hyper competitive talent market while also retooling key aspects of their operations and culture. Today's webinar will provide a deep dive into the research findings of a collaborative study between SODA and organizational partner Deltec focusing on the operational priorities and agency performance in the first half of 2022. Following this research walkthrough, we'll have a lively discussion with industry leaders from Deltec, Envoy, Siberia, and Area 17. Today's moderator will be Tom Beck, SOTA's Executive Director. Before I turn over to Tom, a few notes before we begin. We are recording today's call to return highlights to you and your teams. Please feel free to ask questions, share your thoughts and reactions in the chat or the Q&A function. We will do our best to address all questions and we'll capture ideas for future discussions as well. Tom. Great, well, thanks Lakai and thanks everyone for joining us today. We appreciate it. Uh, we fielded this study, uh, well, I'll give you a couple of details on this, but we fielded the study from May uh, to early July to capture this data. Uh, and we were, we were particularly excited to see some of the results because we know even in the first half of this year, things have started to shift a little bit from uh, where we were at in, in late 2021. Uh, and as, as Lakai mentioned, you know, the survey explored a couple of key aspects. We, you know, we were looking at business performance in 2022 as a, as a you know, first half of the year update. Uh, we're looking at whether working models had started to shift again or not, um, and, and then particularly looked at some of the, the real impact on the talent market and, you know, where, where agency leaders were at today and, and projecting what that impact might be in the future. Uh, and then we also looked at some aspects of uh, technology investments and, and the digital transformation of our own agency operations. So we'll share just a few of those highlights today. And, and then uh, Lakai will mention this again, but you know, for all of you on the call today, we'll send uh, email links out with, uh, you know, with access to the full summary findings. Before we dive in, just a quick, uh, you know, quick overview of the respondent profile. Uh, so this kind of helps you contextualize where the data is coming from. Uh, it, you know, in terms of agency type, uh, you know, predominantly uh, digital agencies. But uh, as we all as we all know, the notion of a digital agency and what that actually means anymore is continues to sort of dissipate. So we have a we have a, a diverse mix of we'll call agency types. Uh, 37% agent, agency, digital agencies, 16% integrated agencies, 11% characterize themselves as consultancies, and on down the list you can you can see there. But I would say a healthy a healthy mix of agency types and how they're showing up in the marketplace. Uh, in terms of annual revenue, this is in U.S. dollars. Uh, we definitely. Uh, we definitely lean towards agencies under $10 million in annual revenue, uh, and even slightly towards agencies under 5 million. So 48% of the respondents under 5 million, 26%, uh, 5 to 10 million. Uh, and then we have, you know, we have a kind of a long tail of respondents that are larger than that. Uh, in terms of roles, primarily founders in, in C-suites or other executives within the business, so I think we're getting a you know a good top-down view of of, uh, of what agency leaders are thinking, and then geography um, heavily leaning towards North America, and even within that, that's largely um, the the U.S. We do have maybe four or five percent from Canada within that North American sample, uh, but the the data will skew a little towards towards a, a North American perspective. But as you can see, we've got some perspectives from uh, Europe, APAC, and LATAM in there as well. Hopefully that's helpful as you, as you see the data and you know the profile of your own agency, you can kind of help match that. I'm going to go through just a couple top level things really pretty quickly. As Lakai mentioned, if you have questions, feel free to shoot them in the chat or the Q&A pod, and I can kind of address them in line as we, as we go through the research. Uh, and we'll we'll pause again before we shift to the panel uh, to address any questions. So for, first and foremost, uh, and most of you are probably experiencing this because you may have participated in the study. Uh, but despite chatter, uh, and I don't know if this is true in your circles, but 
there was a lot of talk and hope for some more return to office uh, coming out of 2021. Uh, and various agency leaders that I spoke to were kind of considering plans for how that might happen. Um, I think that the reality uh, is that return to office in any significant way is not underway. Um, you can see here, we asked around working models and 31% of, of these respondents are still fully or primarily remote. Uh, and then another 45% are we're calling hybrid remote flexible which is really um, employees have the discretion as to whether they come into the office or not. Uh, so, you know, what are you at 70, you know, 76% or so of agencies that I would say are essentially remote. Um, and then, you know, when you scroll down from there, hybrid remote mandatory, which would be agencies that are, you know, remote, but mandating a couple days in the office a week, uh, you're just at 13% there. And then, you know, only 2% fully or primarily in office. I think not surprising given, you know, all of our own personal experience, but I, but I do think coming into the year, there was more suggestion, I think, that even that more people would be, be moving to the hybrid remote mandatory uh, of, of trying to get some of that in, in office experience back underway. Um, and it's just simply not happening on, on a broad scale. And you know the chart to the right explains maybe why too. Uh, so we asked about the sentiment, the company sentiment on the current working model, uh, and you know as you can see, a, a very high percentage doing the math on the fly here, but 83% are positive about what their current working model is. Somewhat positive indicated, oh, we have a few issues that we're working on, but nothing, nothing significant. Uh, so when you look at that, I think that the, the, the data is showing there's, there's little desire, I would say, from a widespread perspective uh, to move back in office at this time in any sort of significant way. Uh, I do see a quick comment in the chat. I just wanted to check that. Okay. Make sure there wasn't a question question there. Uh, so yeah, so I think sentiment, sentiment and desire to... Uh, Sentiment toward the current working model is very positive, and like I said, the de the desire to move more aggressively to uh, some sort of hybrid, even in office environment, uh, is not widely embraced at this time. Hold on. Hey guys, um, I'm I'm back. Can you hear me again? I'm I'm so sorry. It looks like I had a I had a little technical difficulty. Uh, Lakai, can you let me know in the chat window? Okay, so I'm back. Uh, apologies for that. Let's see. Is the screen still sharing? Okay. No, you're you're not sharing your screen right now. Okay. Let me just get that going again, and we'll get back to it. Uh, apologize for that. Yeah, so the so the great resignation. Um, again, I was saying, and arguably, it's I think true across the, um, you know, the the broader economy, and certainly within pockets. But we looked at actual turnover, voluntary turnover rates in 2021, and then kind of expected change in turnover in 2022. 
you know, and the reality was we had, you know, 71% of agencies in this study reported that voluntary turnover was under 15%. Uh, which is not, I would not say is high turnover. Um, and in fact, you had 50, what is it, 56% that were actually under 10%. Now, while for certain agencies, they may see that as slightly higher than what they, they would um, experience on a normal year over year basis, but um, to, to suggest that those numbers are very high or problematic is, you know, is, 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 not, is not true. Turnover rates under 15% are generally considered very, very strong uh, and certainly under, you know, under 10%. So we just didn't see high turnover rates in 2021. Now that doesn't mean that finding new talent wasn't a problem. We'll get to that in a minute, but the, but the, but the loss of existing talent um, in any significant way uh, didn't seem to trans transpire. Um, again, and then looking at expected change in turnover through 2022. So we're halfway through the year. Um, and the majority say they, you know, they say it either staying the same as, you know, they are right now, or actually starting that turnover rate starting to come back a little bit. So suggesting that there's even, um, you know, some slight shift in the market now and that there's, there's some optimism that uh, that the, the trend of the great resignation or, or losing lots of current employees uh, is going to, that that's not going to accelerate, uh, and that if anything, that that pressure will start to ease a little bit more. Um, digging into the data, I will say that, you know, agencies over 20 million definitely experienced higher turnover rates than agencies under 5 million. Uh, I don't think that's, I don't think that's surprising. I think we would, would see that in normal times as well, uh, but, but larger agencies definitely seem to uh, definitely seem to exhibit some some higher turnover rates, but still, again, within very, uh, I would say, acceptable uh, acceptable ranges. Uh, look, it looks like we might have a question, uh, but so I'll keep rolling. But let me know if that's or here. I'll just take a look no, into that. It's just okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, David. Okay. So moving moving on. So. Hiring and culture are still pain points though. So as I suggested, even if the great resignation isn't heavily impacting you know, our existing staff, um, you know, finding, new, finding and hiring new talent still very high on the list. Uh, 53% you know, said that that's one of their top challenges. Uh, but also, you know, culture, culture and, cr and particularly creating a sense of belonging. 62% uh, of agencies said that that's an issue that they're struggling with. And we haven't seen, we've looked at that data point a few times uh, in 2020 and 2021, and that number hasn't moved a lot. Uh, so I, you know, I think this, this challenge continues to exist as we operate in a remote or hybrid remote environment that how we create culture and our ability to kind of sustain culture is evolving. And for, for many of us who've been in the business for a while, we're just still not, we're not as comfortable yet that we can do it as well um, as we used to. We're working on it, but it's still a concern. Um, and, you know, and the biggest impact on the current talent market from a business perspective, you know, 76% said staff costs are rising. And of course, you know, I think we've we've all experienced that, uh, and we'll get into some more data there. Uh, but spending more time and money, investing more time and money on recruiting, uh, has been a has been a big a big impact over the last twelve months. You know, less so. You'll see morale and culture is suffering uh, a little bit from you know the current talent market. So there's there's certainly a subset there. I would call it a healthy minority, uh, but not you know, not a dominant theme. Um, and then other aspects of the talent market being disruptive in terms of say, efficiency declining, or we've had project delays or disruption because we can't get the talent or we're turning away work or whatever the case, as you can see from the data on the screen, you know, certainly some isolated problems and pockets, but not, not prevalent across this, uh, this respondent pool. Uh, so interestingly, um, you know, margins, well, maybe not interestingly, margins have been improving in 2022 from an overall business perspective. And, uh, you know, I would say that generally speaking, we've seen coming into 2021 and then now halfway into 2022, uh, so 18 months or so, it obviously varies by agency and there's always outliers, 
uh, but but we've seen generally a strong rebound for the last 18 months and that that has been continuing into 2022. Uh, so looking at the chart on the right first, you know, these are profit margins from 2017, 2019 and 2021. Uh, you know, and you can see there was actually some very, very strong performance uh, reported in 2021 with, you know, 58% of agencies, and this was a different study that SOTA conducted, but 58% of agencies reporting margins of 15% or greater, uh, which, you know, which I would, would say to have more than half of agencies reporting that is, is, uh, is strong performance. Uh, but then coming into 2022, you know, we still have you know, 30, 40, 44% of agencies that said their margins are continuing to improve uh, in 2022. So significant improvement is five, five points or more. Uh, so if you were operating at 10%, you're now operating at 15% uh, and then improved between one, one and five points. Uh, so strong, you know, strong performance of what, I'll caveat this on the, on the next slide, but Given the rising costs in the talent market, um, it doesn't appear to have completely impacted margin performance yet, and in, in at least for at least for many agencies. But talent costs are rising, and we're also working on billing rates. Uh, so we tried to quantify, and these are within ranges, of course, but we tried to quantify the overall impact of salary and benefit increases over the last year. Um, it, you know, and, and you can see here that, you know, few have reported, and this is average across the board. So few have reported that their average across the board salary and benefit increases are more than 25%. So just 5% in that category. Um, and then the majority are reporting increases of, uh, you know, up to 10% or then between 10 and 25%. Uh, so 37% of respondents said our average salary and benefits uh, have increased 10, you know, between 10 and 25% over the last year. Uh, and then another 47%, they've increased up to 10%. So it gives us a little bit of order of magnitude for you to kind of look at your own cost structures and, and what that impact has been uh, in, in kind of which, which range or band you might be falling in. On the flip side, looking at agencies who've then tried to increase billing rates uh, in, in parallel to this. And it's, it's great. So many, you know, majority of agencies have reported that they've been able to increase billing rates. Uh, you know, 37% billing rates, they've increased up to 10%, 29%, you know, increase them between 10 and 25%. So that's positive. Um, the, you know, the reality as we dug into the data a little more is that, at least 48% of agencies, based on the way that the data was reported, it you know, would suggest that their billing rate increases are not keeping pace with their salary and benefit increases. So the salary and benefit increases have been of a greater magnitude than the billing rate increases. Um, my, I, my belief is that that number is, is more uh, than 48% of agencies, but because of the way we track these ranges, we can only get to a certain certain level of detail with that. So, even though on the previous slide you saw you know margins you know margins increasing for many agencies, there were 26% of agencies that reported margin declines, um, and I think that this data also suggests that uh, there's there's going to be some operational challenges in the months ahead, particularly um, we'll say particularly when utilization rates drop and you know inevitably the demand for our services waxes and wanes and i think a lot of agencies for the first half of this year have been able to overcome increased costs through very very high utilization uh but i think as we get back to more normal utilization rates this challenge of having our cost structure um, accelerating at a faster rate than our billing rates uh could be magn magnified the challenge of that could be magnified for for agencies a couple more key areas. Uh, so agency ops and technology. So kind of looking at um, looking at the digital transformation of our own operations uh, and where where we feel like we're the furthest along in using technology to help us become better at what we do. 
uh, we asked where agencies were most mature and least mature and kind of top areas for investment. Uh, again, this, this data is probably not all that surprising, but you know, so team management and remote collaboration, 55% uh, of that, you know, 55% of respondents listed that as one of the top two areas that they're kind of most proficient in. Uh, and then production and resource management after that. One of the things you can see here, though, is that there's not a lot of there's not a lot of consensus on where agencies are most most mature. So there's not a lot of there's not a there's not a lot of categories, and even team management and remote collaboration at 55 uh, percent is is rel is relatively low. So kind of suggesting that one overall level of um, digital transformation within you know agencies is relatively low. Um, and two, you know, agencies are at very different points in their journeys of embracing uh, embracing technology for their operations. Uh, when we looked at e e least mature, um, it, it's kind of the inverse of it, but not quite exactly. But you know, marketing automation and outbound marketing is an area where agency leaders feel they're the least proficient. Uh, sales, pipeline management, CRM. Uh, and then agency performance tracking uh, in, in in analytics. Uh, and then looking ahead into the into the twelve months twelve months ahead, the top where agency leaders are investing the most uh, in terms of the digital transformation of their own operations, production and resource management uh, is is the top of the list at thirty six percent. HR people ops performance management at 33 30, percent. And that certainly gives uh, that certainly makes sense given given uh, the the talent market we've been navigating, uh, and then sales pipeline management and C in CRM. But again, you can see these are still relatively low low percentages, just suggesting that the the relative priorities for agency leaders are kind of across the board uh, and or somewhat evenly distributed across these different different categories. Uh, outlook and optimism. So. I think one of the biggest, well, I'll start with the optimism piece. So, you know, the good news is six months into the year, uh, you know, I, I think we see a high degree of optimism again. Uh, so we, when we look at, you know, asking about the future growth and health of the agency, we have about 86% of agency leaders said that they're very optimistic or somewhat optimistic. And, you know, Dell Tech had a similar question to this in a, in a study they did uh, in Q2 of, of uh, 2021, so about a year ago. Uh, and that same, same question turned up about 57%. So we've had a, you know, almost a 30% swing in optimism over the last year or so, which is great. Um, and we see, SOTA has seen this in our own data. We've been, we've been doing kind of a confidence, uh, confidence tracking with agency leaders for many, many years. And I would say a, a typical... A typical year would be to, you know, in the low 80s, uh, low 80s would be a kind of a relatively normal level of confidence for an agency, agency leaders. And we saw that drop all the way down to 36 uh, percent in, you know, in 2020, uh, but then steadily climbing back. And then we saw near the end of 2021 uh, that confidence levels had come back to the, to the low 80s. So we've seen this great kind of rebound, and I would say to we'll call it kind of pre-pandemic levels of confidence and, op and optimism, um, and, and that's great. And we've again, as I said earlier, we've seen maybe an 18 month or so uh, rebound under underway, and I think a lot of uh, you know a lot of agency leaders are basing that off of you know how how well things are going. All that said, you know we we got verbatims on you know why why the why an agency was feeling optimistic or not optimistic and i'll share a few of these with you but but the overall theme was we feel really good about our positioning we're performing really really well but there's challenges on the horizon that you know continue to cause you know concern for us and those primarily have to do with uh inflation uh the 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 global economy and a potential slowdown on the horizon and then continued challenges in the in the talent market so i'll just read a few of these you know uh on just the pure optimistic side you know our pipelines larger than ever and the scale of our projects is increasing 
Um, you know, we see our products and services as being essential for clients, even in this economic client, you know, uh, climate, our foundation is in place, our position is tightening, our people operation is humming, and we have an amazing team. So great things to be um, optimistic about. Uh, you know, but again, there's there's these caveats. We're having a record year and haven't seen anything slow, but it seems like we have some significant global headwinds. Uh, things look good now, but the market is volatile with inflation and potential recession. Uh, change is getting more expensive or conflicting indicators, lots of uncertainty and personal burnout. Um, you know, so we see those, you know, and these are people who, you know, these are people who rated themselves as somewhat optimistic or even very optimistic. Uh, so certainly these challenges on the horizon, I think, are top of mind uh, for a lot of agency leaders. Two other things just to point out, you saw a number of these comments, which really, I think, gets to resilience and maturity that they've pointed to the last few years and what we've had to do to change and you know, address the current market. And that gives us some higher degree of confidence that uh, we can navigate whatever challenges are ahead of us. You know, so one said, our ability to pivot our business during COVID has given us the experience to watch the signs and make adjustments as needed for our clients. Um, you know, another one said, I'm optimistic because the changes we faced in the last two years helped us improve efficiency, uh, work pipeline and marketing. Uh, so certainly uh, some optimism just related to the changes uh, that we've had to make just to even navigate, survive, and be successful over the last few years give us, give us a better foundation. Just a couple of key takeaways from the study, and then I'll, I'll, I'll transition into the panel discussion. But And again, you can get access to the full summary findings uh, after the webinar. But as I mentioned, financial performance for agencies steadily improved in 2021 and even into the first half of 2022. Uh, so the, and there's a lot of optimism around kind of the future health of the business. Uh, considerations around return to office, I think it have been largely tabled for the time being. So if that even was a consideration, uh, that was more broadly discussed in the second half of last year. I think for the time being, the majority of agencies are um, committed to the to the remote model that they've put in place right now, and the high satisfaction numbers around that certainly indicate that there's not a lot of pressure uh, from the market or their employees to to move away from that. Um, pressure in the talent market is you know starting to ease though I think, uh, and agencies in this study exhibited high levels of employee retention. Uh, but we do know that rising costs for talent have put some pressure on the on the operating model uh, and and on agency performance in general. Uh, and this could be a heavier burden to bear when demand for services slows or our utilizations drop. Uh, agencies continue to look at digital transformation for their own operations. Uh, they also see emerging technology as a as a place uh, we didn't cover this uh, in in one of these slides, but it's another question you can find in the data, but that agency leaders see emerging technology playing an important role in improving operational efficiency, enabling distributed teams to work more effectively, uh, and then in actually longer term augmenting their core services and capabilities, making them better at what they do. And I think that, the, you know, for me, the bottom line takeaway is despite high degrees of optimism, agency leaders have expressed clear concerns around inflation, uh, global economic slowdown and continued pressure in the talent market. And I think that, you know, the takeaway is that we need to be very disciplined and proactive uh, about the about the next few quarters that we're entering into to ensure that the gains and the momentum that that we've had in the past 18 months aren't completely aren't completely erased. So I'll stop with that if there's any I don't see any in the QA window right now or in the chat, uh, but I'll, I'll give you just a moment. And if uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and, and pose those now. And I'll start to move to the I'll start to move to the next slides, but certainly feel free to raise those. I will mention this. We'll come back to this in just a minute. But this. Uh, sorry, I'm getting rid of my chat window. 
Um, this research is part of a larger thought leadership report that we've worked on with our great partners at Dell Tech. Uh, that will be released this afternoon too. So the summary research findings, as well as uh, you know, articles from Dell Tech, Column Five, Media Monks, and Reason, uh, that are all kind of related to the to the current talent market and sort of operating in operations within you know the current marketplace that we that we find. So urge you all to check that out and, and download that when you get access to it later this afternoon. All right. Um, yeah, so there is a question from one of the attendees. Can the data specific to APAC be shared as well? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, I, uh, I, I pull that for you individually and then just understand that that sample size is relatively small. Uh, you, you know, so you're looking at, I think it'd be less than 15 respondents, maybe like 12 or 13 respondents from the APAC region. So I, I don't know that it would be a statistically valid sample, but it could give you, as long as you view it through that lens, it could give you a, a slightly more specific uh, flavor. So one thing, uh, since I, this is an anonymous attendee, I can't see your name. Um, Lakai, if you can just, uh, you'll put my email address into the chat window. And, and for this attendee, I would urge you feel free to, um, feel free to contact me through email and I can get you that data just for APAC. All right, no other questions. So I'm gonna, and as we get into the panel, you can raise questions too, but I wanna bring on a few colleagues and we're gonna, we're gonna talk through not really the data, but just some, some themes and uh, topics that are, are inspired or related to the data. Uh, so I wanna introduce uh, Reagan Riddock from Dell Tech. She's a senior uh, product marketing manager at Dell Tech. And she'll be joining us today, Julie Blackburn, who's the Director of People Ops at Siberia. Uh, Gemma Davis is a Talent Director at Area 17. And Luvi Delgado, who's uh, Heads Up Production and Operations at Envoy. Uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, get these guys to get them on camera and we'll, we'll start a discussion here. Give me just a second to transition my screen here and thank you guys. Thanks for joining us today. It's good to see you. You too. Yeah, great to be here. So I'll have you when I when I first uh, pose a question to you, I might just have you restate your name and let everyone know where you're where you're calling in from today. Um, and the other thing I'll just mention to the panelists, uh, I will. Uh, I'll direct the questions to each of you and move it around. But if you uh, if you want to comment on a question that I didn't call you on, feel free to you know feel free to weigh in. Uh, so I want to start with. Um, I want to start with just a you know, and I'll I'll start with a Gemma maybe on this one. But you know, I think the it, it's kind of interesting in the data that we both see the challenges in the talent market. Uh, in terms of the level of competitiveness and rising costs and finding talent and all of that. Uh, but we have started to see some signs of that easing off, I think, as, as maybe, you know, the economic picture starts to at least get a little bit cloudier. Uh, and I'm just curious from your own experience, maybe you can just share how how you know how how you've navigated the talent market in the last, you know, six to 12 months or so, what kind of observations and impact you've seen from it, but then also, you know, are you starting to see it ease up in any kind of meaningful way? Yeah, cool. So I'm calling in from upstate New York. I'm usually in Los Angeles. So I'm having a nice little humid moment up here. Um, mm -hmm. But I think, you know, for us, we learned a lot last year of the, the timelines we had, the expectations we had for hiring were just too much uh you know we we thought we could have a really long lead time we thought and it and it we really needed to ramp that up um so we learned a lot i think we shortened what our hiring process looks like we got really smart about where we're putting our jobs how we're talking about these opportunities and we've been able to shorten those lead times so hiring people faster we've 
been able to bring on, I think, 11 people in seven months, which is kind of a, a record for us in speed. Um, so, you know, give us gives us some apprehension about, you know, the months ahead. But, you know, we we've nailed something within our process that is feeling really good. And now it's about, OK, let's let's look at the experience, the onboarding, you know, all of those optimizations and, and the freelance network. Um, but I'm feeling pretty hopeful about this kind of, you know, not that we've cracked through COVID and through a really right. hard time where you'd need people and you couldn't find them for months and months and months. Um, and we just had to kind of learn and, and optimize process, I think, to just make things change. Yeah, and I've, it's interesting. I've heard a lot of, you know, we've had a lot of discussions in the soda community around that. And it seems like it's been a really good opportunity for, um, for all of us to kind of rethink our recruiting processes, our interview processes, uh, who's involved in them, how we can make them more streamlined and efficient and move and move people through that. I've heard that as a consistent theme of just one of the ways of tackling this, which is like, we just have to get better at hiring more quickly and taking the talent when we can, when we can get it. Um, have you seen just, the, you know, in the, in the, in this year, even in the last few months of this year, and I know it probably depends on whether you're hiring anyone or not, but have you have you seen the intensity start to ease up a little bit in terms of what the talent market looks like, or is it still kind of feel like the same as it was in mid-2020, you know, Q3 of 2021? Yeah, we definitely have seen it ease up. I think, again, we've kind of like, we pivoted this year, we started doing a kind of cohort mentality of hiring. So looking at what are the open roles that we have? When do we need them by? What's our timeline to get there? So we've just hired seven people that all started last week. And uh -huh. so looking at this as bunches of like our next open hire may not be for a few more months. That's okay. Let's get organized and figure out what that priority is. Um, and so using our time more wisely, I think to, to, see if it you know we're not really sure yeah. yet if it's easing up or not so let's just find a new way to do it <laughs> yeah for sure for sure so julie i want to shift you on that similar question you know in, in siberia kind of what are some of the key key areas of impact and ways you've had to navigate the talent market in these past months and and then you know and are you seeing it start to shift again it, you know as we enter the second half of this year yeah for sure i think well the first thing comes up we're we're not doing a ton of hiring of full-time folks at the moment and, and we're not doing high volume hiring. So most of the, the bringing on talent is in the freelancer space. I think that what we're noticing is rates are really just, are just high. Like we, the cost of bringing on great people and even bringing on younger, or not younger, but earlier talent, if you will, um, it's, it's high. So we're having to look at that and I'm in, like the slide that we looked at in terms of bill rates and seeing that, like, are we keeping up with that? And I don't know that yeah. we are given this year and what we're seeing. So, I mean, intense pressure. I mean, it depends on how you, you put that out there, but we're, we're having to navigate that. And I think for us, a learning and something I was jamming on with someone else in the Soda Network about really creating that really great experience with freelancers so that we can, um, build our networks from word of mouth and, and just giving that amazing experience. So people will talk about the great experience they're having with Siberia and, and it's a great place to work and, and, and using that as a, as a tool to also be able to expand our networks without paying like agency support um, and just doing it organically that way. So I think that's what we're noticing and learning and, and just being really responsive and creating a good experience for freelancers is really key. Yes. yes. Yeah, my under my understanding and talking to Chris and some of the other leadership too is that you know you guys lean pretty heavily into freelancing, like at you know at much higher percentage rates than your kind of typical model, and it yeah. seems like you've kind of con continued to to stick with that, and you know and I've heard that from other members of now adopting this sensibility of of you know we do all this work to create great cultures and onboarding experiences uh, for our full time employees, but we need to be thinking about our freelance network in the same way because that's in, you know in a lot of ways now a more direct and regular extension of our own team yeah. than it has been in the past 100 percent, absolutely nailed it yeah well thank you thank you so i want to switch gears a little bit and just talk about um talk about operations just a, a little bit and kind of the role that technology is is is, is played over the last couple of years 
and particularly in, in um, you know, creating a more collaborative remote work environment, but just also addressing some of these fundamental principles of efficiency, how we manage kind of the wor workflow and all of that. And, you know, Luvi, I'll start with you and then move over to, to Reagan. But, you know, what are you, what are you seeing, you know, from, you know, within Envoy Group, especially over these last kind of like 18 months is we've obviously shifted, you know, shifted work models. Um, you know, where have you seen the pressure in terms of like the way that you guys operate? Uh, and, you know, what are some areas you're focused on uh, in, in terms of, in particularly with technology of improving the way that either your teams work together or, you know, the visibility that you have into the pipeline or the way that you're looking at, you know, resources, all of this has become really, really urgent in the, in the last, you know, 12 to 18 months. Absolutely. I think that from an operational just resourcing uh, standpoint, we shifted over to Mavenlink, I think, the beginning of last year and just really diligently look at resourcing, forecasting, et cetera, just across the groups in general. Uh, there's three different agencies, three different locations and just right. kind of keep that pulse in there. And then as well as understanding, obviously, like the network and the freelancer network. And we're very dependent on that as well. Very yeah. uh high level of documentation just to onboard freelancers and teams. So that's also technology. We use a lot of mirror boards, um, a lot of yeah. documentation in that way so that they come in, they get onboarded to whatever it is and then move on. I think from uh, just doing the work and collaboration technology, I mean, the big one was real-time collaboration, mm. flexibility. So we hired people across three different zones now. We're solely hybrid, obviously. and. Um, a lot of the work in our Chicago office is physical. And so building out the um, the conference rooms, the, the QA area, the prototype room with flexible um, cameras and just a lot of like meeting event technology um, mm -hmm. platforms so that we can be collaborative and video as well as physically in person. I mean, have you started to see a you know a positive impact to that? You know that it's that it's that it's helping the way that the teams can kind of communicate and connect with each other. Absolutely, I think. I mean, we built we're technology forward here, so we built a lot of right. kind of prototypes and things like that. You know, you've seen those robots in in hospitals where they have the the iPad. We can have <laughs> something like that here because we do installs in different locations. Uh, yeah. You know, including Japan and. And we kind of built that up a little bit just to make that happen. So we use that day to day now. Um, our engineers are in Atlanta and Austin and Portland. And now we kind of all collaborate at the same time. If you think about the, you know, I guess some of the the pain points or some of the big, bigger <laughs> areas that you're still, you know, and yeah. they're never gone, right? You know, so I don't want to suggest that they're ever gone. But what what's kind of top of mind for you in terms of that, that, that operational piece and, you yeah, know, where, you know, and in particular, kind of where technology helps at least play it play a role. What's yeah, I mean, top of I mind think, for you right now? Yeah, I think obviously everything has to be done collaborative and hybrid, but doing vision sessions and those brainstormings, even though they're super efficient now, because people have to be proactive and plan ahead and you know work really hard to set expectations. There's still that missing in person feel as well as yeah. anything they do like with um, physically. If you're seeing people are not paying attention, if you, you have to be very in tune with what people are feeling, thinking, et cetera, if not switch topics right away. That's a that's a point pain point, I think, in, in yeah. uh, just creative in general. Yeah, yeah. Reagan, I'm, I wanna pull you into this this piece, add a little another layer to it. But, you know, first of all, I'm, I'm always struck by the, always struck by the data around adoption of tools and technology in our own businesses. And, you know, as far as we've come, we still generally lag, you know, investment in our own internal operations relative to the great stuff that we create for clients. Um, you know, as you see some of that data around, you know, where, you know, where agencies feel like they're mature or not mature, does any of that surprise you or you know i mean you're out talking to clients all you know all the time and you've got a platform that helps solve a lot of these problems but i'm just curious if even even after you know 12 to 18 months of uh you know the pandemic and i think intensifying the pressure to invest in these areas that you know we still seem to be a long way away 
Yeah. I was kind of thinking that along the same lines, like I'm not surprised at all to see that a lot of agencies are saying they are very digitally mature when it comes to especially team collaboration. Right. And then the right. second item on that list was um, production and resource management. So I'm not surprised that they're saying that. However, I feel like at the beginning of the pandemic, especially agencies were very reactionary. We picked up all the collaboration tools we could possibly use, right? Yeah. And we did everything that we could to kind of get our arms around operations when it comes to project and resource management. However, I think there's a very fine line to solving your problems with technology or creating a bigger problem, right? So I think uh, we've learned a lot. It's been two years, right? So we've learned a lot. And I think probably a lot of your respondents that are saying we're really good at team collaboration now probably learned that whole lesson of, okay, we've really got to focus in on the right collaboration tools. And like, let's make a dedicated way to collaborate about this project. You know, you can't, you can't be having your cell phone ring and your IMs and your emails, and then, you know, possibly your project management tool, you know, collaborating within that. You need to make a focused agency-wide decision on, we're gonna talk about this project within the project. We're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk to clients in emails. You know, you need to be very focused yeah. on how you're collaborating so that it doesn't create a whole bunch of communication chaos, right? right. So I'm right. not surprised that they said that they're, that's that, where they're digitally yeah. mature because they probably do have a lot of tools that right. are kind of band-aided together to do that. Um, but probably over the last two years, they've learned a little bit more about utilizing that effectively to be more efficient and actually be more um, collaborative yeah. at this point. What do you, so to build on that, it's, it's like, it, absolutely, that makes sense that we've focused in, in many ways on that kind of key piece. Um, you know, the last, again, the last 18 months, it, again, for, for many agencies, but, you know, this is obviously generalized and each of us have our own experiences, but, you know, generally speaking, we've seen a market of pretty high demand, um, pretty high utilization rates, uh, not, not quick access to talent, you know, and all of that, you know, has put, put pressure on just the ability to kind of forecast who and what is needed when and how the heck we even make that happen. Um, you know, and so I'm surprised in some ways that we've not maybe seen some more movement on that end, but I'm curious, you know, Reagan, again, from your, you're out talking to a lot of agencies, what kind of advice or, you know, do you have for agencies getting started more on their operational side of their platforms of you know, what to, what to tackle first and how they can kind of make meaning, meaningful steps? Because I just imagine if you don't have pretty good visibility into your pipeline and you don't have pretty clear, even semi real time views into what your resources are on and when they're going to be done and all of that, in this particularly tight talent market with very high utilization rates, it seems like that's going to create a lot of excess uncertainty and, and pain for agencies. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the the smallest step you can take, and I know everybody, especially creatives, hate to hear this, is tracking time. <laughs> you know, um, once you know the hours that are being put into a project, you know, eventually you can there are ways you can move away from always chasing timesheets and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. but you don't know what your costs are. Like you don't know how to bill something until you know what your costs are. Right. So I think tracking time is a great place to start. Then you can get a, a greater idea. Like you were saying, transparency and visibility is so key, especially when everybody's working from everywhere. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to get a little bit of real time transparency and visibility. But then the next step, to that is connecting that to other processes like you were talking about like your incoming work you know what kind of resources are going to be needed on that if you're connecting those two uh, departments and all that kind of data you're going to get a better idea as to how to forecast for yeah. the resources you need right like okay. Um, Julie was talking about they they rely on on freelancers so much and many project-based agencies do um, but how do you know when you need freelancers in 
enough time to get them? How do you know if you can even afford it yeah. with the projects that are coming in? You know, if that data is not connected and you're not keeping track of the hours that are really going into a project that you're doing and, a, and, and estimating correctly the projects that are coming in, there's really no way you get that visibility. There's no way you can forecast. And, and that's right. the big thing. In my experience as a creative manager myself, like I had no forecasting abilities and it was just right. a daily grind. So right. that forecasting really comes from, you know, the baby steps of really tracking your costs first and then connecting that data. Then you can get the transparency visibility and then that future looking. Um, yeah, and I definitely see that in the, you know, the, the, the data. And I think like rightly so, we focused a lot on remote team collaboration and kind of making that as successful as we can. And that plays a big role, obviously, too, in the in the cultural, you know, that we, that we have. So making sure that teams can feel connected to each other and do great work. That's what drives them in this, you know, business. But there is this this other layer now of just the fundamentals of you know, forecasting, resource planning, and visibility that I think are essential. And, and you know, a lot of us are still in, in early stages mm -hmm. there. You know, my feeling is if the last 12 to 18 months haven't demonstrated the, the importance of that, or, you know, lit a little more of a fire there, then, you know, I don't know what, what would. Mm -hmm. um, how do you guys, I'd be curious, like, yeah, Julie, just on like a visibility perspective, like, how do you guys feel you're doing and, you know, and where is, you know, you, I you mean, know. yeah, I think yeah. Well, we don't time track. So, and it's like, it's a bit of a, people are a bit allergic to that. <laughs> um, a little bit really rely on, let's work with the pharmaceutical, we'll work with the pharmaceutical industry on, do you have an aversion to entering your timesheets? We've got a, we've, yeah. got a, we've got a prescription for you. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it's, we rely, and I'm, I'm new at Siberia. I've been also, I forgot to mention I'm based in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. That's where I am. That's where I live. Um, so truly the remote worker. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, and I'm new at Siberia, so I'm about almost three months in. And so learning, you know, how we've done things in the past and it's, yeah, it's a bit of a grind to be honest. Like I can really relate to that where, and, um, it's just a lot of playing around with folks and making sure the team, like we only have about 15 people on our team, right? And so, and that's including ops. So it's, we're just a really experienced team. And so also just looking at freelancers and just staying really tight. We have a weekly planning meeting that's, that I run. Um, you know, we have a team planning channel that we're always constantly updating and, and moving around folks. And it's just always like playing this like Jenga game, if you will. Um, or I guess what's, what's, that, what's that game, uh, Tetris. Um, mm -hmm. so we're constantly doing that and constant in communication, but that is an area that I'm, and, and, and my ops lead Jack, that we're really trying to push and creating a one-stop shop. So I don't have to constantly, what's happening here, what's going on here. And like asking the questions where we have one right. place, at least where we have those conversations happening. And there's a, there's a doc that we can, can access. So that at least there's a little bit of, um, centrality to that. Um, and I can just go to one area and that's starting from, even from the biz dev opportunities, right? So yeah. really just being able to have that run all the way through to the project starting and when the SOW is, is signed. Um, and I think that helps create efficiencies. We're just, we're small and nimble. So it, we yeah. just, we do operate a little bit differently than maybe a large agency with tons yeah. of people. Yeah. You can over, so. you can certainly overcome more, you know, the, the smaller you are, you can overcome more with conversations one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one and small group interactions, but yeah, you know, even, even there, I think, you know, the, these things can still help. And it's, it's, it's honestly better to have that foundation in place before you're growing than while you're, while you're growing. So it just gets very, very difficult to do. Um, Absolutely. So for, for the audience, if there's questions, let, let, it, let us know. We're going to go another maybe five to 10 minutes or so. So feel free to pop questions in the chat or the Q&A window. Um, but I saw the one about onboarding freelancers already. Um, oh, is there? Is there one yeah. in there? Yeah. Yeah. Let's, hold on. So, let, me, let me see that there. Oh, I missed it. No worries. Yeah. Uh, oh, there. Yeah. What does the onboarding process for freelancers look like? Yeah, Julie, go ahead and address that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I think for us, definitely a personal touch. We're really clear. We also have, we use Okta and we use Okta for um, 
our, our full-time people and our freelancers. So that just allows, and like Bamboo HR. So once we set them up, everything is kind of generated automatically to them. Um, yeah, that personal touch, I think is really important. We set the, the standards with invoicing really clearly from the beginning. So they really know what to expect. What do they need to include so they can get paid the first time around and that there's no bumps along the way. And that really allows for us to have a great process. And then also just giving them access to the team, the project teams before it even starts and allowing them to get and understand like the way we're working and how, what we're talking about in the Slack channel and just bringing them into the fold um, earlier than before the project starts. Um, and I think there's room. So th those are the key aspects like that we, we think about. Um, it's not like magic or anything like that or anything out of the ordinary, but just to make sure that we're also we give them the tools and, and where to find the answers and we're very accessible to them when they have a question. Um, mm -hmm. And then the same with offboarding, I will touch on that a little bit too, because I think that's important is just allowing them to still, we have an alumni channel on our Slack, people are still connected, um, you know, really making them feel like they're part of the family because they really are. We really rely on them and we really love them. So um, just that's, that's how we, we roll at Siberia. Yeah. You know, I've also heard uh, this isn't exactly part of the onboarding process, but I've heard of some members um, introducing like referral fee, um, you know, referral fee bonuses for freelancers within their within their network. So if that freelancer can't do it, but they have another great resource. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a lot of ways, I see the movement is is trying to treat this freelance community more as an extension of your team and giving them as many kind of like privileges and as and as yeah. much um you know as much as we give to our employees to make them feel welcome belong um you know be be successful in the environment let them know that we value them as much as we can you know you know with legal things that exist and all that that <laughs> yes. seems to be a lot of you know it seems to be from the folks i've talked to a lot of the ways that they're trying to view the freelance community yeah. We even 100%. have like an onboarding manual to send ahead so that they know exactly what file format, everything. And then offboarding, Julie is right, is how to package those files and send them our way. But, yeah. yeah. So yeah, John, was, oh, go ahead, was, Gemma. Yeah. I was just going to add that like freelance talent can also be booked up far in advance. You yeah. know, it's like that yeah. was a learning curve of, oh, you're also scared about what's going on in the world and trying to book up for months and months. So we had to, I think, you know, increase that engagement and what that personal touch looks like so that you're the first person that they call when they open up and you're not the last. And, you know, th that that timeline, you know, high touch. <laughs> it needs to be high touch engagement with your freelancers for sure. Yeah. So I want to stick with you, uh, Gemma, on this and we'll, we'll actually move around the group on this. But, you know, I think, you know, and many of our verbatims showed us this too, you know, we've, we've, we've learned a lot or we've had to tackle a lot of either new issues or tackle issues more quickly than we've had in the past over the last couple of years. Um, you know, and I, I think the hope in a lot of ways is that those things that we've learned or new things we've put in place actually prepare us better for volatility in the future changes. But, you know, I'm curious, Gemma, from your perspective, like, what are some areas as you look back now over the last couple of years, like we're actually doing this thing now that we're, we're better off or we're, we're better positioned to, to, to kind of navigate the future now that we've taken this particular step? You know, are there things that pop to mind, you know, for you? Yeah, I think for me, I think about kind of the, the remote hybrid experience, which we've talked about, I think a little bit before, but yeah. like this idea that working remotely was a benefit. It was a perk. It was okay. Let it, you know, we, we're a small team too, you know, Julie. So we're, we're high, highly aware of where everyone is and what they're doing and like what the hours of, of connection are. And so when people were remote, it disrupted that culture. And I think we kind of didn't know what to do with it. It was like, yeah. how are you going to sit around the lunch table and have a conversation and be in person for that hard, hard conversation. Um, and so just being thrust into having to figure that out remotely and not having a choice, I think we're really better off now and we're much more adaptable to the freedom and flexibility that people need and want right now. Um, yeah. I think also, you know, taking everything, we were really high, I think like intensity on email and everything needed to be officially communicated over email and crafted perfectly and all these things. And it's like, no, let's huddle, let's chat real quick. Let's solve this live. Let's get mm -hmm. it done and move on. And I think we've all really appreciated that in our own work. And so we, we jump in a little bit more when people just need a quick 
um, a quick conversation or or just you know troubleshooting. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool because I've actually heard of a lot of people who who think that the like the, the communication burden now of uh, remote is actually it's harder for them. You know, it's like all I yeah. do is send you know send email. Yeah, I think you have to have like personal that you know. I think yeah. I think you have to establish that cultural boundary. Of, like it's okay to go offline for a few hours. Right. And, be heads down and we want to encourage that. But also when you're online, we hope that you'll be helpful because you may right. need someone's help tomorrow. Right. Um, and, a, and a quick answer may solve not needing a 30 minute meeting, you know, totally. later in I the think week. that's really, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's really smart. How about you, Reagan? I mean, it's, and, and this is you maybe more of an observation across, you know, agencies and clients you work with, you know, what do you, what are some things you think we've kind of gained in these last couple of years that really help, you know, help us better better navigate kind of the future and uh you know and maybe part of that just what what we need to what we need to focus on next either in in, in building on that um i think what i've noticed a lot of our customers focusing the most on you know is again that digital transformation making sure that they can keep the doors open and, and work coming in and people productive from anywhere and i think one of the things that people have kind of come to ter terms with and, and realized is an important thing is the fact that whatever they're using throughout their agency needs to be a, a cloud-based solution so that it's yeah. your data secure, your clients can be confident that their data is secure. Um, you know, if they're, if your freelancers are working from, you know, Puerto Vallarta or, or something like that, they can access what they need. As long as they've got a Wi-Fi wi connection, they can get in securely from anywhere. And that, you know, it, it goes to show that you can also, you know, help the culture in that way and let people be a little bit more flexible in working from wherever and, and having that work-life balance because you've got this, this solution that can be accessed from anywhere and you don't have to worry about security concerns or anything like that. Right, right. So yeah, continuing to kind of lean into the, some of the, I suppose, investments we've, we've accelerated in terms of, look, we actually need more tools and, you know, better ways to run, run our teams, uh, especially in this remote environment. So Luvi, I want to get a, get a quick perspective from you on this. Um, I think that, yeah, I think that I agree with Reagan. I think a lot of it is that it's a collaboration, that digital. I think the cons of that is also a keep of adherence to yeah. the process on how to use it. I think that one is kind of, it's annoying to keep going back in every couple of months, but like you can see it wane a little bit of like people are just dropping files here and there and like just everywhere. But it is that keeping track and that adherence to make sure that we're all collaborative together. Yeah, Julie, we'll end, end with you on, on the kind of same thought. What are some, I mean, you just, you just joined Siberia, so it's probably a little, little tougher for you to, to, to answer, but um, I, yeah, you, I mean, I think sort of sorry. gained, you know, that we've gained and we actually do better, better now. And it's, it's, an, it's improving kind of our ability to be successful in the future. Well, I did want to, there's something I like talking track that I wanted to mention that like even I didn't think of. And before we went into this panel, I asked some of our team members just to weigh in because I love to share what other people think. And um, and and we when we think about remote working and um, like not neurodiverse folks, for instance, and thinking like actually now that we've switched to remote, as things have become a little bit easier because they have less distractions in a meeting room. They're mm -hmm. able to control their auditory environment. Mm -hmm. um, they're able just to focus in and, and go off, off camera or go on mute when necessary. And they're really able to kind of focus because they have a little bit more control. So for them, it's actually collaboration is becoming easier. And I think that's really important to take in mind because uh, we're not maybe always thinking that if you're, if you're not neurodiverse. So, um, I think that's just like a really important thing to keep in mind as, you know, if we go back to an office or we staying within that hybrid environment to keep that in mind and, um, yeah, it's just a different perspective that I didn't even think about either. And I really appreciate that. Um, and then also, I think just when we think about collaboration and, you know, when you were talking about, we can't just like, we're you're going, jumping on a huddle or there's different time zones. It's even just like using a Slack status update, like, Hey, I'm, I'm heads down for yeah. two hours, like put that in your Slack update, like, or like put it where people are, are there so that we know that you're there, but we know also that you're, you're just, you're really working on something, but you're not gone. 
And so it's just creating that transparency while we're working. I think that can be really effective. It's just some small little things like that. Yeah, I, that's a really cool observation, I think, because this is like heightened sensitivity around individual working styles and, you know, what's what what makes everyone more kind of successful. And, you know, I guess in a, not that we didn't have that to some extent in the office, but I, but I think there is this like a homogeneity, I guess, to like how we work in an office environment. And, you know, in a way, this the, the remote kind of working model forces us to have yes some similarities in that in that way but allowing a lot more variation in kind of individuals and how they can best engage uh and can really help us kind of get the most most out of our teams but also for our team members for them to feel you know successful and for them to have like the best conditions they need to do their best work so 100 percent yeah well, well, thank you guys so much. I'm going to bring, um, I'm going to, we just have uh, kind of one couple last announcements, but I want to thank Julie and Gemma and Luvi and Reagan for joining us today. I really appreciate, uh, appreciate the time and appreciate your perspective on this, this, uh, these topics. It's been great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was fun. Yeah. And look, Lakai, you go ahead and uh, I'll bring you back on and you can can close us down. Sure. So again, for everyone joining, thank you. As a reminder, we have recorded today's discussion. We'll return that to you and your teams. Thank you to our panelists as well as Dell Tech for being a part of this conversation and leading us through this discussion. As a reminder, the research is accompanied with editorial contributions from the SOTA membership, as well as Dell Tech, and it's all packaged beautifully in a report, which will be released tomorrow. Um, all attendees will receive an update with this recording, as well as a copy of the research section, and then a link to premier access for that report. With that being said, we thank you for carving out time for joining us today, and we will talk to you in a future discussion. Have a great day. Thanks.